It is really good to be back at Westminster Church. Um, thank you for allowing me to stand before you with the Word of God. And I do pray that this Word will encourage us and challenge us. You have warm greetings from Matthew Lamus in Ghent, Belgium, where we also live. Uh, and Matthew started his church plant, and we attend that every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And then, of course, warm greetings from the Turkish church, IPC Ghent, Murat and his family, who has a worship service uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which we also attend. And uh, we're very thankful that uh, Westminster Church has been part of our Belgian partnership, and that Chad has been part of that, and we're very thankful for his input and his, uh, his time to us. So, with this, let us turn to... Uh, the word for today, uh, coming from Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 17, guess who's coming for dinner? The reason for this text and the title is the September 2021 table talk issue written by Paul Levy, the pastor of IPC Ealing. The title of the article is simply this, three questions for evangelism. And so Paul writes, we keep sowing, planting the gospel seed. We accurately, uh, we, we're accurately aware that God gives the increase. It is his work. And we confidently rest in Jesus' promise that he will build his church. I do think, however, that times like this in the life of the church should be focused outward, thinking how can we reach out? God has placed us where we are, and he is in the different circumstances that we face and working in the lives of the people we know. If you are anything like me, you can be very shy in taking the relationship further in speaking about the gospel. But I have found it helpfully, helpful recently to think of three questions that I hope you might be able to use in praying for and speaking to your friends. Would you like to come for dinner? Would you like to come to church? And would you like to read the Bible? The International Presbyterian Church has been a strategic ministry partner of MTW, uh, and we have, you know, for the last 20 years. This European based denomination goes back to Francis Schaeffer and his vision to plant international Presbyterian churches alongside his Libri ministry. And when we got involved in, uh, with the IPC in the early 1990s, the nomination consisted of five struggling churches until IPC Ealing, the flagship church of the denomination, hired a young pastor, Paul Levy. Today, the IPC, today IPC Ealing is about 150 strong and growing, and the UK Presbytery consists of 82 teaching and ruling elders serving churches and church plants in England, Scotland, and the European continent. So this brings us to the reading of our text, and as is the practice, let us stand for the reading of God's Word. Mark chapter 2, verse 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. May we see it. So as you all know, Mark is one of the shortest, is the shortest of the four gospel. And it's intensely practical in nature, focusing on the saving ministry of Jesus, so it's not so much biographical or chronological, but it's put together around theological themes. 
And Mark begins, uh, begins by highlighting the early Galilean ministry of Jesus. And in chapter 2, uh, features five conflicts between Jesus and the Pharisees. The first conflict is recorded in the first 12 verses and was introduced uh, with a question, verses 6 and 7. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like this? He is, <laughs> he is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The significance of the second conflict is once again brought into the open with a question. The Pharisees asked Jesus' disciples, verse 16, why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors? In other words, the pivotal question today is not who can forgive sin, but who needs forgiveness of sin. And to deal with this question, we're going to look at Levi, Jesus and Levi, Jesus and Levi's friends, and Jesus and Levi's opponents. So first, Jesus and Levi, who needs forgiveness? Now, not very much is known about Levi. We know from verse 14, verse 14 his name, his occupation, and of his interaction with Jesus here. And on, the, and on the surface, Levi's world may seem pretty average, without many issues or problems, but nothing really could be further from the truth. So let me explain a little bit about Levi's world. First of all, he was a Jewish tax collector in the service, in the service of Herod, who himself was subject to Roman rule. And as a tax collector, he was in charge of customs, and he occupied a booth on a major international road that, went, that started out in Damascus and went through Capernaum, uh, where this incident actually takes place. And so tax collectors were expected to take a commission in order to, to make a living, but many of them abused the system greatly and overcharged and became very wealthy because of it. They were hated for cheating and their support of Rome and were classed really with the vilest of men. In some Jewish literature, they were listed with murders and robbers. So sure, his profession had made him wealthy, but he was a complete outcast social outcast, excommunicated from the synagogue, and an absolute disgrace to his family and to Israel. I'm sure Levi's private world must have felt miserable, to, miserable at times as he contemplated his circumstances. But the decision that had caused Levi to become wealthy on the one hand and an outcast on the other was now going to give him the opportunity to meet and follow Jesus. Now, by the time Jesus speaks to Levi, Levi, Levi in all likelihood was well aware of Jesus and the people he associated with. It was very likely that Levi had actually seen Jesus as, as well, because everyone who traveled to Capernaum eventually had to pass by his tax collector's booth, and his disciples, and Jesus and his disciples traveled to Capernaum very often. So one day, Levi looks out from his booth and sees a large crowd coming in his direction. And right away, he thinks, well, that must be Jesus. And so all attention is suddenly focused away from his booth to Jesus and the crowd. And so now, try to imagine his, his thoughts. Boy, I wish I could meet him. He's not like all the other Pharisees. He's healed a leper. He's healed a paralytic. He even claims to forgive sin. But I'm a tax collector, and Jesus is a Jew. He's an important Jewish rabbi. He would never, never want to have anything to do with me, nor ever want to talk to me. But then he notices the center of the crowd, pushing closer and closer to his booth, and now Jesus is actually within reach. And then suddenly he hears his name. Levi, follow me. Stunned and surprised, he cannot believe it. Not only is Jesus calling me by my name, but he's also 
inviting me to become his follower. Now the command to follow is much more than just the command to walk after someone, but has the strong implication to imitate or to become like-minded. And this kind of following was impossible without a radical change from within. A change impossible without faith and repentance. And Jesus had said as much at the very outset of his ministry. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 17. Jesus says, the, the, Mark says, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said, come and follow me. Repent and believe and follow me. So Jesus had met Levi in Levi's world in order to explain and to show him why he had come. Like the paralytic in the previous story, Levi heard words of mercy. Levi understood instantly he was a sinner in need of forgiveness. And so Levi got up and became a Jesus follower. He walked away from his booth that day. He said goodbye to Rome. He said goodbye to, to Herod and all his wealth to become a follower of Jesus. And maybe some of you are in the same situation Levi was in. You are caught in a cycle of sin and you don't know how to get out of it. So let Levi be your object lesson. On the one hand, in Levi we see sin defined in all its power over him. But on the other hand, we meet Jesus who is able to overcome sin's power by his invitation, by his word, to follow him. Jesus said, I have not come. I, I, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus and Levi, who needs forgiveness of sin. We all need forgiveness of sin, don't we? All the time, every single day. Now, for those who are followers of Jesus, who have come to faith to Jesus, who've come to Jesus in faith and repentance, how are you following? Remember, we follow a person, not a religious system. Peter makes this very clear in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example, that you should follow in his steps. We have been called to imitate Jesus. So how are we doing? How are you doing? And this brings me to the second point. Jesus and Levi's friends, how do we follow? Verse 15. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, Jesus had said, behold, the kingdom of God is near in chapter 1. But how does the kingdom of God draw near? Only if sinners repent and believe the good news. And how are sinners confronted with the good news? Only when followers of Jesus go and seek them out. And that is precisely what Levi does. And how does he do it? Very simple. We can all do it. He reaches out to his friends and tax collectors and sinners by way of a party. And the invitation reads, guess who's coming for dinner? His friends too were social outcasts and inferiors to the Pharisees. Jesus could not reach those people in the synagogue. So Levi gives a great party to introduce them to Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, Levi immediately understood and put into practice several kingdom principles. First, mixing with non-believers is essential to God's redemptive efforts. 
That's why, you know, Jesus talks about the church as being salt. Salt needs to touch something in order for it to be effective. He's calling the church, he's calling us to touch people. He, he, he said the church needs to be light. Well, you have to turn on the light. We have to turn on the light so people can see us. So people, so people can see Christ in us. So people can see the gospel. So one very important expression of following Jesus is to share your Jesus with your unbelieving friends. And hospitality is one way to expose your unbelieving friends and acquaintances to Jesus and the gospel. It's something we all can do. To share what you have with others. Would you like to come for dinner? How difficult is that to ask? Would you like to come for dinner? Would you like to share in what I have? And that's precisely what Levi did. Another kingdom principle Levi understood was Jesus is the only one who can save sinners from judgment, from eternal judgment. Now I know hell is a very unpopular concept today, but without Jesus, our unbelieving friends are forever lost. They need to know the very simple truth that Jesus alone can forgive their sin. C.S. Lewis said it this way, The safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Doesn't that describe most of our unbelieving friends? Jesus warned about the eternal judgment all the time. He said it very clearly. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, absolutely no one, comes to the Father except through me. So Levi cared so much that he came up with a strategy and a plan. And you actually get a better feel for this when you read, when you read Luke's account, who mentions actually that Levi held a great banquet at his house for a large crowd. Now banquets and, and feasts are biblical pictures of intimacy. Intimacy with the Lord and of a saving relationship with the Lord. Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 25, verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Isaiah 55, verse 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And then, of course, Jesus himself, in describing the, the parable of the wedding feast, says this in verse 4. Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and the fattened calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. This brings me to the second question Paul Levy asked in a Stable Talk article. And that is, would you like to come to church? The Bible describes the church as the household of God. Ephesians 2, and the household of God that comes to worship is a foretaste of this great banquet Jesus describes in Matthew 22. And Isaiah talks about in 22 and 55. Would you like to come to church? So you have to seize the opportunity to rub shoulders with non-Christians if you're going to reach anyone. And many opportunities are right there in front of you. Simply invite your friends and acquaintances to church and worship. How are we following Christ? How are you following Christ? Now, in closing, notice there is a third party at Levi's house, the Pharisees. And they think Jesus and his disciples are doing evangelism the wrong way, eating with sinners and tax collectors. Are you kidding? Now, the word sinner in our text refers to a class of people who were regarded as religious, you know, regarded by the religious elite as inferior. 
because they did not follow the the pharisaical interpretation of God's law. By eating with sinners, Jesus engages in an intimate, intimate fellowship with them, something unacceptable to the Pharisees. Because it would mean that they, because it would mean that they would become ceremonial unclean, and meant they could not participate in the religious rituals of the temple worship. So when the teachers of the law, it says here in verse sixteen, were when the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciple, "Why does he eat with sinners and tax collectors?" On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have, not come, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And because of the Pharisees' reaction, Jesus responds to their criticism with a common Jewish proverb. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And with this, he makes, with this proverb, Jesus wants to get some, wants to get some, very, wants to get some critical points across. Simply this, he says, only when you realize you are sick do you seek out a physician, don't you? And the physician, in turn, spends his time with the sick. Obvious. But how can the physician help the sick if he's not willing to get close to them? And how can the sick get better if they are unwilling to seek out a physician? Is is, is that not the purpose of the physician? To heal the sick. But you consider yourselves healthy. And so you don't need a physician. And this is why Jesus adds to this proverb, revealing his messianic mission. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So he says to the Pharisees, no, I don't spend time with these people because I condone their sin. I spend time with them because they recognize their need of me. They recognize they're terminally ill. They recognize that I am the one who can heal them of their terminal illness. Those who are righteous do not need to repent, do not need saving. But then who is righteous? Only God is righteous. None of us are in ourselves. The Pharisees were self-righteous and therefore therefore did not recognize their need and their need of the ultimate physician, the Lord Jesus. This story makes clear that the invitation by Jesus for healing and restoration is is for those who recognize they have no righteousness of their own. The invitation does not make sense to those who are self-righteous, like the Pharisees of Jesus' day. And this brings us to to two questions. One, whose word are you going to believe? Whose voice are you going to listen to? Levi chose to listen to the voice of Jesus instead of the Pharisees. Now, there are many voices today competing for your attention, competing for your loyalty, just like they were in Levi's day. And listen to the warning of the author to the church, uh, to the author of Hebrews to the church of his day, when he says this in Hebrews 3, verse 7, and Hebrews 4, verse 2, this. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the the rebellion on the day of of testing in the wilderness. And of course, that's during, he's talking to the people of God who have left Egypt. And then in chapter 4, verse 2, he says, For the good news came to us just as it did to them. They got good news. They received good news way back then, as they did then, as they did in, in the day of the of the writing of Hebrews, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Whose voice are you going to listen to? Whose words are you going to believe? And this brings me back to Paul's, Levi's article in Table Talk. Would you like to read the Bible? Would you like to listen to the word of God? Would you like to hear the voice of the living God? Isn't this at the heart of what Paul is saying in Romans 10, verse 13 to 15, something we read earlier? For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them or talking to them or sharing with them? And how are they to preach or share or talk unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You see, we are all sent. Not all of you, not all of you are sent as ordained ministers of the gospel. But we are all sent. We are all sent once because Christ lives in us. His message lives in us. We all bear witness to the truth of Christ in us. We are all sent. Let me conclude with a quick story out of a book written by Mar Mar Maria Shepion, of whom the world was not worthy. And she tells the story of an evangelist, Yaakov, who wants to witness to an elderly man called Zimmerman. And this is how it goes. As soon as Jacob began to speak, Zimmerman told him, Jacob, don't talk to me about Jesus. I don't believe that Christ is real. And Jacob said, well, tell me why. And Zimmerman explained, do you see these church ministers there with their clerical robes and big crosses hanging over their chests? I know, I know who they are on the inside. I know their deceit, their power. I know the violence with which they have lived. They preach about Christ, but I watch their lives. Jacob, don't talk to me about Jesus. So Jacob replied, Zimmerman, what if I broke into your home, stole your coat and your boots, and wearing them robbed a bank? What if police chased you but couldn't catch you until later they would come to your house and, and confront you about the crime? What would you say? He said, well, I didn't do it. Ah, but Zimmerman, Yaakov said, what if the police recognized your coats and your boots and was convinced it had to be you? What would you say? I know, I know what you're driving at, said Zimmerman. Just leave me alone. Don't talk to me anymore. Days went by, weeks went by, months went by, and Jacob kept coming, living Christ before Zimmerman. And finally one day, Zimmerman asked, Jacob, how do I come to know this Jesus that you proclaim? And Jacob gave him a simple answer. Turn your life over to him, repent of your sin, and commit yourself to him as your Lord and Savior. Zimmerman knelt beside Jacob and trusted in Christ. And when he got up from his knees, he embraced Jacob and said, thank you for being in my life. You wear the rope of Christ very well. And so the question is, how are we wearing the robe of Christ very well? You and me. Would you like to come for dinner? Let me introduce you to my family and Jesus. Would you like to come to church? Let me introduce you to the family of God, my family, my church family and Jesus. Would you like to read the Bible? Let me introduce you to the voice of God. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for Jesus, our Savior, for Jesus, our Lord. I thank you that in him we truly have the forgiveness of sin. I thank you that we are, that we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit that we cannot be taken out of his hand. And I thank you that the power of the Spirit is within us, enabling us to confess, to witness, Lord, to go, to invite people into our homes, to invite people to church, to invite people to read the Bible. Lord, give us a heart for the lost. Father, give us a heart for our friends, our neighbors, that do not know you. Help us to be like Levi. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.